So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So people are coming into the room right now. Okay, and I'd like to welcome everyone here to the TC1 <laughs> track, uh, Mars Aquaponic System. And our presenter here is Carl Greenbaum. And uh, Carl, yeah, you can get started then. All righty, well, thank you. And uh, folks, welcome to uh, my presentation. I'll be describing a concept for an aquaponics facility for a Mars base to provide farm to table food for, uh, for long duration missions. And I've observed as a space geek uh, over the past decade or so that every successful program has a tortured acronym. And so here we have the Mars Experimental Aquaponics Long Duration System or MEALS. Now, the military version of you know, MREs and NASA's uh, tube food uh, provides nutrition, but it's, you know, it keeps folks alive, but it's not exactly, you know, farm to table kind of food. And that's what this system is about. And if I could advance. Sorry about that. My slides are not advancing. Hang on. There we go. So the meals concept is based on an aquaponic system uh, where you blend uh, raising fish uh, in a big fish tank and you use the waste products from the fish. Uh, you process them through bacterial colonies to uh, create nutrients that are available for the plants. And then the plants absorb those nutrients and return clean water to the fish. Uh, the system is gonna use tilapia uh, as, the, as the fish, they grow really quickly and they are remarkably tolerant of uh, variations in uh, water, water parameters. Vegetables and fruits are grown, uh, you know, just in the, in the, uh, the fluid. Uh, there's no soil involved. And we're gonna try to create as little task loading on the crew as possible while, while feeding them. And we're also gonna try to provide as much food for the fish uh, integrated into the system. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a perpetual motion machine, but we can get a lot of protein to, uh, to supplement the, the feeding of the fish. Now, this diagram describes that shows the main components. We've got a fish tank, the radial flow solid separator does what the name describes. Uh, there's a bioreactor that uh, processes the ammonia and turns it into something accessible to the plants. And then the fluid then goes into the sump where it's pumped you know, back through the, the flower bed, the, the plant beds and the vegetable beds. The mineralization processor on the bottom uh, is where the magic happens with the solid waste. It gets heavily aerated and we get to extract some more nutrients from there. Uh, but the first step, the fish metabolism produces ammonia and solid waste. Uh, both of those get conveyed to the solid separator. And that's done with a thing called a, a solids lifting siphon. The insert photograph shows the blue bar, which is an air stone, which generates uh, you know, lots and lots of air bubbles, which create uh, lateral currents along the bottom of the tank that collect all the solids into the siphon and siphon it off out of the fish tank and into the solid separator. From there, the solids go into the mineralization processor, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the the water with the ammonia from the fish waste goes into the moving media bioreactor. The media is, as shown there, the little plastic cylinders. Uh, the trick there is to get the maximum amount of surface area for a given volume because that surface area is gonna be uh, populated with bacterial colonies that process the ammonia. Uh, step one is to process the ammonia into nitrites. And then there's another bacterial colony coexisting in there, which converts the nitrites to nitrates. And that nitrates are 
accessible to the plants. That's what they use for nutrition. So we get the nitrates uh, moving into the sump and the mineralization processor has yet another family of bacteria, colony of bacteria, which extract micronutrients from the solid waste. Uh, that happens on perhaps a weekly basis as opposed to the, the upper flow through the, the moving media bioreactor, which in fact operates on a time cycle of, of hours. Uh, the mineralization processor, after about a week, uh, we can uh, settle out the residual solids and the micronutrients get pumped into the sump for distribution to the, uh, to the plant beds and the duckweed uh, fish food beds. So that's pretty much the, uh, the process flow. Now, in order to get this all started, to get this bacterial magic to happen, uh, there's a process called initial cycling. Uh, you put some ammonia into the tank, and that ammonia provides food for a colony of uh, nitrosoma bacteria, which create the nitrates, that's the yellow trace. And then the presence of the nitrites uh, promotes the formation of an expansion of the nitrate bacterial colony, the nitrosoma bacteria. And that's where the nitrogen that the plants get to use comes from. This process takes a little over a month. Uh, it's usually done by just seeding the system with ammonia. Uh, some people use sacrificial fish, but there's a lower mass penalty to just use the ammonia and it's, uh, it's kinder to the fish. So in the hydroponic section, uh, there's lots and lots of uh, vegetable and fruit choices. Uh, they have varying requirements in terms of temperatures and pHs, uh, but in almost all cases, we have to strike some kind of compromise because the plants generally like pHs in the 6.5 and below range where the fish tend to be happier at about 7.5 to 8. So something in the neutral range uh, is tolerable to, to everyone. Uh, the, uh, the, we use two different uh, structural techniques for the hydroponics. The most efficient technique is called nutrient film technique or NFT. And that's illustrated in the upper photograph where uh, these, these rectangular tubes have the, the nutrient fluid flowing through them. And as it flows through, uh, it wets the, the roots, the roots extract the nutrients, and yet there's root area exposed to the air so that the roots can get oxygen as well. And that combination is, it promotes very effective growth. The only real limitation is that because the nutrient channels are relatively small, you can't grow root vegetables or anything that has a thick root ball because it would clog the channels. Uh, to accommodate root vegetables, uh, the lowest level of the hydroponic beds will be a media bed. That's the lower photograph. And those, those little brown spheres down there are expanded clay pellets that have a large water holding capacity. And, uh, and obviously, they can move around to accommodate uh, root vegetables growing uh, in the root systems. And so kind of as to pay homage to Mark Watney, we can grow potatoes as well here. In terms of how big a hydroponic facility you need, uh, notionally targeting a crew of six, we'd like to provide all the fruits and vegetables that they'd eat. The literature describes uh, area requirements for hydroponics ranging from about five square meters per person up to 20. Uh, 20 is kind of descriptive of a suboptimal outdoor on, you know, on the earth uh, facility. Uh, five square meters is a little optimistic in my view. And so I've used 10 to size the system. So we need 60 square meters. If we stack the, the beds four high, we only need 15 square meters worth, worth of floor space to, uh, to accommodate the, the fruits and vegetables for a crew of six. Now, 
some people, you know, immediately, you know, think that we're going to need bees and, and bats and, uh, and butterflies flying around uh, in the habitat. Now, butterflies might be nice, but it's really not necessary. Uh, many of the vegetables that we would prefer to grow uh, are self-pollinating. That is to say, the male and female parts uh, of the plant exist on the, in the same flower, and so they pollinate themselves. Uh, to get a little more breadth in terms of the, the vegetables and fruit available, uh, there are some wind-pollinated varieties where, uh, although the, the male and female parts don't exist in the same flower, they do exist on the same plant. And so uh, that's why they're called wind-pollinated. And to facilitate that, the system would include electronic ventilation fans to, uh, to move the air around and, uh, and the pollen. Shouldn't be a problem, although butterflies might still be nice. On the aquaculture side, I mentioned that we selected tilapia. Uh, as you can see, they tolerate a wide temperature range. Uh, many of the other popular fish for aquaculture are trout and salmon, but they're cold water fish. And uh, since the habitat if one assumes that it's kept at the same 22 degrees C that the ISS is kept at, uh, it's spend a lot of time you know, chilling the water. Uh, the tilapia grow quickly up to a, a kilogram in about eight months. Uh, and they tolerate wide variations in water quality. And perhaps most importantly, uh, for a self-sustaining sort of operation, they have a remarkable food conversion ratio. That is to say, how many pounds of food do you have to feed to get one pound of output fish or whatever. Now, some beef cattle, uh, their food conversion ratio is up to 20 to 1. Uh, but in the case of the tilapia, it's about 1.6 to 1.8 to 1. So they make good use of the food and that's less food that we have to worry about. Another possible uh, protein source is down at the bottom there. The giant freshwater prawns also grow quickly. They're, they're happy in a similar temperature range. The only problem with the prawns is that when their eggs hatch, they have a larval stage and the larvae are hard to feed and it's much more fiddly to, uh, to, to raise them, uh, perhaps in the future, but I wouldn't certainly recommend them for, uh, for an initial system. Sizing the tank for the, the system, you know, nobody's going to want to eat tilapia seven days a week. And there's obviously going to need to be other sources of protein for the crew. But we target the fish production at about, you know, provide about half the crew's meals. And for a roughly half a pound fillet, we're going to need a total of 2.6 kilograms of fish a day. And if you work out what the steady state contents of the tank would be, it comes up to a maximum of 624 kilograms. Uh, just like in the case of the hydroponics area, uh, numbers vary for uh, tank densities, but uh, 42 kilograms per cubic meter is probably a, a good, uh, you know, probably in the sweet spot. And uh, that means we need a fairly modest tank of 15 cubic meters. So, uh, and we partition some of that off to raise fingerlings. Other than that, uh, the, would be for grow out of the adult tilapia. Now, gardeners and, and aquarium hobbyists love to spend time tending their gardens and their fish. And we certainly hope and expect that the crews, you know, will enjoy uh, interacting with this system, but they have work to do. And so, you know, we're not sending them to Mars to feed the fish. So we've created as much automation as we think is prudent, which is in fact uh, pretty much an, an absent of, you know, a failure. Uh, we can automatically take care of pretty much everything from, from dosing food and adjusting temperatures to controlling the lights and adjusting all the water parameters. Uh, it's a notional automation system. Uh, it's not at all complicated. You notice 
that the measurements are taken from the fish tank while the dosing and the adjustments happen in the sump so that there's, by the time the water gets back into the fish tank, there's no localized concentrations. Uh, in terms of the lighting, uh, there's a set of lights. I'll talk about the light types in a second. But they, uh, on the terrestrial systems, typically they light the beds at uh, 14 hours on and 10 hours off. So on Mars, we'll do 14 hours and 37 minutes on and 10 hours off. And you also notice we'll also uh, you know, put the dose the, uh, the fish food as well. All right, in terms of lighting, uh, we're gonna have multiple layers, uh, multiple stacked layers of, of grow beds. And we need a, a, a thin, light that doesn't generate a lot of heat and doesn't use a whole lot of power. And so LEDs uh, seem to be the way to, the, to go. And perhaps more importantly, the LEDs, uh, since each light is made up of dozens or in some cases hundreds of individual diodes, uh, you, can be, you can tailor the spectrum uh, to what you think is optimum for the plant growth. And recently, some studies have suggested that, that a lot of blue light creates thick leaves and a, and a, and a better, more robust uh, vegetable, while light in the far red uh, is, is better for the flowering of the plants and, and other uh, stages of growth. So, you know, by changing the mix of, of LEDs, you can develop a light that's just what you want for a particular family of plants or the whole plant. The, all the lights don't even have to be the same uh, in the system. As I said at the beginning, we'd like to generate as much food as possible. Uh, we'll grow duckweed. Duckweed is duckweed plants are 25 to 35 percent protein. So that's a, uh, you know, that makes a really good food. We would also use all the fish scraps uh, and the veggie scraps. Uh, we'll just put the duckweed and all the scraps into a into a macerator and store that in a food tank. Now, it would be nice if we could keep doing that and just grow the duckweed and feed it to the fish along with the food scraps and everybody would stay happy. But of course, every time you take a plant uh, or a fish out of the system, some important nutrients go with it. And so even though the bulk food uh, can be created within the system, uh, we're gonna need some supplemental nutrients uh, to uh, make the system work. So if we feed the fish at 2%, uh, you know, we need about a little over six kilograms of food a day. Uh, we get a little more than a kilogram out of the, uh, the fish, fish and vegetable waste. So we need to grow five kilograms of duckweed which would require another 15 square meters of hydroponic beds. Well, it turns out that 15 square meters is the footprint of the, the rest of the system. So one whole, a fifth level will be added to, uh, to grow the duckweed. And I estimate that we'll need about 100 grams a day of concentrated nutrient powder uh, to offset the loss from the extracted food mass. So uh, that's not, you know, over a three-year mission, uh, you know, that's not uh, an inordinate, you know, mass penalty for keeping your fish and your, and your veggies happy. When it comes to meal preparation, the vegetables are, and fruit are pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the plants are grown in these little black seed cups. You can, you can see the, the hand holding onto there. So you pull that out, you pick off the vegetables that you're going to eat, you take the rest of the plant and throw it into the macerator, and then you put another seed back in the, in the net cup, put it back in the system, and you start on the next generation of, uh, of plant. Uh, preparing the fish is, is a little more time consuming. First, you have to net it, then you have to fillet it, and then you have to cook it. However, uh, and filleting in general is the most time consuming of those activities. Uh, of course, if you've watched an experienced fisherman fillet a fish, you know that uh, with enough practice, people get really good at it. Uh, but lacking that, we're gonna be harvesting the fish at virtually the same size 
uh, throughout the operation of the system. So an automatic fish filet is a, is a possible addition to the system. When it comes to meal times, um, I'm sure that most meals on the ISS are convivial affairs, but here's a group of astronauts sitting around with a bunch of food tubes taped to the table or Velcro to the table, uh, not the same as sitting down for a more normal meal at home. Numerous studies in the past few years have shown significant benefits to having plants and fish tanks in the workplace. Uh, increases in employee productivity, uh, stress reduction, uh, improved well-being, all these attributes are, uh, have been, all these improvements have been attributed to uh, plants and, and fish tanks in the, uh, in the workplace. Uh, several of these studies uh, cited uh, decreases in absenteeism, which probably, hopefully, will not apply uh, on a Mars colony. So this is a notional floor plan for the meals habitat. Uh, it's one element of the Mars base that I'll be talking about later today in uh, session TC6. But you can see these, basically there's four sections of vertical stack trays that add up to now a total of 75 square meters of growing space. And the five by three meter uh, tank with a section for the fingerling growth. And some, you know, the rest of the area is uh, allocated for uh, the rest of the work operations associated with uh, running the system. Uh, the, the structure itself uh, has environmental control equipment and storage on the two. This is, the structure is, uh, is like a low angle Quonset hut. And so the top and bottom sections are, are pretty low so that uh, we use that for storage. And uh, if you want to know more about the habitat and how you make it on Mars, please join me at, for TC6. It's been an interesting study, and you know, there's, uh, there's a lot that's well established in terms of the, the technology and the science associated with uh, having an aquap aquaponic system, but there's still many things that we don't know. Uh, the acoustic, uh, shock and vibration environment of launch is uh, is an unknown in terms of its effect on either the the eggs or the, the small fry. Uh, some folks have done experiments in the uh, NASA launch environment simulator. Uh, the little fish seem to fare pretty well, but there's still some questions there. Uh, when we get to Mars, we're going to be in. Uh, you know, roughly a little more than one third Earth gravity. And there's a non-trivial concern about whether the fish will thrive and uh, reproduce uh, in that environment. Uh, it's something we probably won't have a definitive answer to until we get to Mars. I will simply observe that, uh, that those same unknowns apply to the people as well as the fish. And the last concern, and this is one that we can deal with uh, while we're still on Earth, has to do with the balance between the fruits and vegetables and the, and the fish. Uh, does, you know, when, when a aquaponics farmer, you know, on Earth grows a bunch of vegetables and grows a bunch of fish and he sells whatever he grows, uh, he's not concerned about whether the the mass of the fish and the mass of the vegetables taken together makes a balanced meal. That's not part of his thing, but we certainly care about it for this system. And, uh, and so there's other issues like the, you know, how much nutrient supplementation do you need and things like that, which you could learn uh, on earth. So next steps. Well, it's probably worth creating a demonstration system somewhere and run it in as closed loop uh, configuration as possible. One possibility is to add a small demonstration system to the MDRS Greenhab, and uh, and you 
you do this, you can learn a lot about the longevity of the filter beds and, like I said, the nutrient supplementation, as well as the balance between fish production and uh, vegetable production. Oh, you have uh, five minutes left? Excuse me? Oh, you have five minutes left? Yep. Thank you. Uh, here's a quick example of a demonstration system. It's six cubic meters. It's two by two by one and a half. The tank is about just under a half a cubic meter, so it'll support about 20 kilograms of fish. And it's got four, four layers of, uh, of growth. Uh, you know, something like this could be built, you know, almost anywhere. And uh, we'd learn a lot about the, uh, how these things work. And this is what we hope for. If only they grew this fast, this whole thing would be much easier. But I just, time-lapse growth is just fascinating. And unless you think we're growing green peppers, it turns out they're not. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I believe we have some time for questions. Okay. Yeah. So the first question is, uh, do you have a link to the study on which this is based so that people can look at later? Um, I have, uh, yeah, I can, I've been working on the briefing and the complete write-up is not complete yet. When it's complete, I will upload it to the, uh, the society archive and it'll be available. Okay. And then another question is, is aeroponics also being considered by your team? Aeroponics. Um, no. Um, it's certainly uh, a possible consideration, but my team is me. So, uh, no. <laughs> okay. Then uh, how will the fumes from cooking be recycled? Uh, how will the what and cooking? Uh, the fumes. I guess like oh. ventilation. Oh, um, I haven't really delved into that, but I'm sure that there's you know recovery mechanisms for uh, for recovering the uh, the you know cooking the output of the, the the grilling or whatever technique we use. Okay, so could sunlight be used instead of LED lights? or is the light intensity on Mars insufficient? Well, there's two, I would dearly love to use uh, natural light, uh, but there's, there's really three problems. One is that because we've got five layers of stacked growth beds, uh, you need a lot of mirrors to redirect the sunlight to uh, get, you know, the, to, to get adequate lighting. Uh, and it's probably not going to be bright enough without a very large uh, collector. When I, the design for the, for the Mars base does include rotating heliostats that direct sunlight into the habitats uh, to provide area lighting. But that's at a level of like 500 lux, which is, uh, you know, inadequate for the plants. And the third problem is that uh, while the sun is, um, you know, is very, it has a good spectrum for humans, at least humans living on Earth, uh, it doesn't have the photosynthetically active uh, frequencies that you'd prefer to ensure f uh, rapid plant growth. So, you know, spectrally, it's not as, it's not optimum. Okay, another question is, is it possible to know the name of these bacteria for nitrification? Yeah, the, uh, the bacteria that convert the ammonia to uh, the nitrites is uh, nitrosoma, and the bacteria colony that converts the nitrites to nitrates is nitrobacter, and the bacteria that operate in the mineralization processor are I have skipped my mind. Hang on a second. Uh, da, da, da. 
heterotropic bacteria. Which oh, and just so everyone knows, uh, we're now at the end of time for this workshop, but we could probably continue with some more uh, with questions, uh, if that's okay with you, Carl. Sure. Uh, and then, but if people want to go into other workshops, you can do so. And just so everybody knows, the workshop that was for TC2, which also has to do with food on Mars, uh, that workshop was canceled, and that was supposed to be the next one on this track. But uh, so, yeah, if you want to move on to other workshops, you can do so, but we'll continue with questions now. So another question for Carl here is, uh, have you looked at using pulsed light instead of continuous light? Um, assuming you don't mean uh, pulse as in 14 hours on and, and 10 hours off, uh, I have not. And, uh, but it might be something to look into if there's some some research that suggests that's a good thing to do. I'm certainly, anytime I get to shut off something and use less power, I'm, uh, I'm willing to give it a try. Okay, and how do you manage genetic health of the fish and duckweed population? Uh, do you use large tanks, multiple and separate systems, monoculture disease? Um, honestly, I hadn't, uh, you know, that's something that, I'd need to consider further. I really hadn't uh, taken that into account, but should. Uh, another question is, why don't we send a robotic mission first and set up these installations prior to human voyage? Um, in general, uh, we will be sending robotic missions to set up some facilities. Um, but I imagine it would be, and it would be nice to have all the fish all grown up before you arrive, but um, I'm not sure that one could reasonably automate the, uh, the establishment and, uh, and initial operation of an aquaponic system uh, purely robotically. Okay, uh, what does the O2 budget for this kind of system look like? Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit positive. Um, if you, uh, the analysis that I saw, uh, showed a net, uh, oxygen surplus, a, a small net oxygen surplus, but he included the consumption of the two people who were staffing the, uh, the system. Uh, he included their oxygen requirements in that. So, uh, there's excess, excess oxygen. And then have you looked at recycling human waste through the aquaponic system? I have not. Okay. Uh, yeah, and that's uh, pretty much it Yeah, for the questions here. Cool, yeah. Well, yeah, thanks again, Carl, for this uh, workshop here. Okay, and, uh, and I'll talk to you again at, uh, in a couple hours. Okay, okay, bye.